What's going on, Space Invaders? Today I'm joined by Andrew Dotson, a physics PhD candidate, and I thought it would be a good idea to try and explain my astronomy research to a physics PhD student. So I've had a few different projects that I've worked on since coming to my astronomy program, um, but I'm just going to focus on one of them today. And so my topic of research that all these projects center around is galaxy evolution. So today I'm going to be talking about um, Lemon Alpha Nebulae and how they relate to galaxy evolution. Okay. So let's get started. Um, I'm sweating so already. <laughs> I feel like I should know this stuff because I've heard you give a bunch of presentations before, but I know if anyone were to ask me specifically what you do, I just... You do, uh, you do stuff with the galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you might know what a Lyman Alpha um, transition is. If you don't, it's the transition uh, between the first excited state and the ground state of a hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the strongest, uh, when this happens, this is the strongest emission line that you would see in a hydrogen spectrum. Um, and so what a Lyman Alpha nebula is, is a cloud of hydrogen gas that's emitting the Lyman Alpha line. Um, and it's basically the, the host site of forming galaxies. So it's the site of ongoing galaxy formation. Um, and these are really interesting because they're like laboratories that we can use to understand how galaxies form and evolve. So basically the galaxies forming in these clouds are feeding off of the gas and then um, also spewing material and energy back into the gas. So it's kind of this cycle of like feeding themselves and then barfing back into the cloud. <laughs> okay. That's a good way of picturing it. Yeah. So the big questions that surround these nebula are, there's two of them. So first one is what's powering the Lyman Alpha emission? If you're going to have all these hydrogen atoms with the electron in the first excited state, you got to have something putting energy into them to be able to do that, right? They okay. can't just be like chilling there and then excited on their own. Um, and then the second big question that people ask a lot is how is the gas that's emitting, how is it moving? So like what are the kinematics of the gas? Um, the gas that it's spewing in? So just the gas that the, the um, objects are embedded in. Like, is it flowing into the galaxies? Ah, okay. Is it getting spewed out? Is it just chilling there? Is it like rotating? Stuff like that. Um, right. And so to answer the first question of like what's powering these uh, emitting blobs of gas, um, there are like four main mechanisms that have been put forth by the literature. Um, and so let me go over those real quick. The first one is fluorescence. So this relies on having um, a source embedded in the cloud that is emitting ionizing photons. So these are photons with enough energy to ionize hydrogen, basically, at, at the very least. Okay. Um, they can ionize other things. If it can ionize something with a higher ionization energy than hydrogen, it'll still ionize hydrogen, right? Just to make sure that I have the picture. So you have the galaxy that's in some kind of gas, and you're saying there's other stuff in the gas that's emitting some ionizing radiation or something? There's something, embed a galaxy embedded in the gas. Uh -huh. That galaxy or cluster of stars or whatever it is, is emitting ionizing radiation ah. into the gas. Okay. And so this allows um, the hydrogen gas to be ionized. And then as it's recombining, as it's recombining, the electrons cascading down through the different levels and it'll hit that N equals two to N equals one gotcha. level and emit Lyman alpha. Um, and so that's called fluorescence. Um, another mechanism people have proposed or have seen is called scattering. So this is when that source that's embedded in the cloud is emitting Lyman alpha photons. So it already has that transition going on in the galaxy and it's emitting Lyman alpha photons directly from the galaxy. So these are like lower energy photons that can't ionize the gas. Okay. But the thing about Lyman alpha is it scatters very easily off of hydrogen gas. And so that Lyman alpha photon emitted from the galaxy scatters out into the gas and excites some of the hydrogen out there. And then that de-excites and emits Lyman alpha. And that just keeps happening as it's scattering out of the cloud. So that's that um, center one. You can see like the arrows where it's just like hitting different hydrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. and then um, basically just scattering out until there's no more gas for it to scatter off of. So that sounds like it's like, it just so happens to already be in that state where it's going from two to one. So it's just the galaxies or these things that are in the galaxies are just, they happen to already be in the... It could be that like maybe you have um, a star forming region in the galaxy and it's emitting ionizing photons into the gas around it that's in the galaxy. And then the, the recombination thing happens and so like the galaxy gas is emitting Lyman alpha, and that propagates out. You following this memo? Obviously, the Lyman alpha from the source scatters off of hydrogen, which becomes a source of more Lyman alpha. Um, the last mechanism, or not the last mechanism, but another mechanism people have put forth, this idea of gravitational cooling. 
So instead of relying on radiation energy, this is relying on gravitational energy to excite. As a, a galaxy or a source that's forming into a galaxy is embedded in the cloud, it's accreting gas from that cloud of gas, right? And so as that gas is accreting along filaments into the galaxy, um, the hydrogen gas in those filaments is like jostled around, mm -hmm. and that can excite the electron into a higher excited state, and then it de-excites and emits lemon alpha. That's like probably one of the ones I understand the least, this gravitational cooling, and there aren't any examples of it observationally, mm -hmm. um, because it'd be hard to identify something that you can't see, because it doesn't rely on having a bright object that's emitting a lot of light, it just relies on having a lot of mass there that can accrete um, the gas and cause it to get jostled okay. around. The last one that I have not read much about in the literature is called shock heating, um, which I mean, it kind of sounds self-explanatory, but I'm not going to try and explain it because I don't, I haven't really learned much about that one. Okay. And so the project that I have been focusing on um, in my program is trying to pin down which of those mechanisms that I just explained is responsible for a lamin alpha nebulae that we observed that has been like the center of debate. So the blob that I'm talking about was discovered in 2006 by Nielsen et al. Um, and they looked through all the multi-wavelength data of the area around the blob and didn't find any galaxies or sources that could be responsible for powering the emission. And so they were like, oh, we don't see anything that's like obviously able, like strong enough to power it. It must be gravitational cooling. And so that's basically what they argued in this paper and that was the takeaway. So in 2015, uh, a few things had changed. First of all, there was new data from like HST and Herschel. These are, um, HST is the Hubble Space Telescope um, and Herschel is an infrared observatory. These are both space-based, I believe. There were also more recent theoretical simulations um, about what the properties of a gravitationally cooling nebula should be, um, trying to figure that out. And so my advisor back in 2015, when she was doing her, post, her second postdoc, um, took this new information and went back to that blob um, where it was located and looked at the different objects that were there and actually found um, six galaxies that were associated with the, the nebula, including an infrared, a mid-infrared galaxy that was obscured. So it only shows up in mid-infrared um, radiation. We can't see it in any, any other part of the spectrum. And so she used um, basically the mid-infrared data points to argue that it was an obscured AGN that's located like really close to the nebula um, like within the nebula and argued that it was actually fluorescence that was powering the nebula instead of gravitational cooling um, caused by the mid-infrared AGN. So using her data for those six, what were they, six galaxies? Or? There were six galaxies, um, I think including, one of them was the mid-infrared AGN. Okay, and she's claiming that this is the, it's due to the fluorescence, not the scattering yeah. or the gravity because the main argument in the previous discovery paper was that, oh no, there's no galaxies, there's no sources near it, it must be the option where you don't have to see, obviously, powerful sources. Um, but then going back and she finds all these sources and is like, well, more often than not we see Lyman Alpha Nebulae powered by either scattering or fluorescence, so is it more likely that it still is a gravitationally powering nebula, or is it more likely that it's fluorescing due to an AGN? If there's evidence for an AGN, that's probably more likely. So you see all of these galaxies that are emitting these uh, Lyman alpha. You see that and you're trying to just know why is it emitting that? What, what is powering this? You see a blob of gas emitting Lyman alpha and you want to know what's causing what's that. causing that. Is it that there's something embedded in it that's causing it, like the fluorescence or scattering scenario? Mm -hmm. Or is it that it's getting jostled around due to gravita gravitational cooling? What's so special about Lyman alpha though? Why that? It's the strongest um, line in the hydrogen spectrum. Okay. So it's going to be the brightest one compared to like the Balmer lines or... Okay. Um, but it's in the UV. And so, so this blob that we're looking at is like a high redshift object, meaning it's closer to the um, beginning of the universe, I guess, like in terms of age. Sure, okay. Um, and so we observe this this nebula in Lyman Alpha because Lyman Alpha is a UV line and so it, it red sh like UV can't enter our atmosphere. So if it was close by to us, we wouldn't be able to observe mm -hmm. it because that would get blocked out by our atmosphere. But since it's at a higher redshift, that UV line gets redshifted into the optical 
and then we can observe it. So that's basically how these things are identified so far out. So previous observations of this object have been taken with either band imaging, so like narrow band imaging focused on a single wavelength, or uh, long slit spectroscopy of the object. And so with imaging, you get spatial information, right? You can see like where everything's distributed, but then you lose information about the wavelengths, wavelength which is like tied to the kinematics of the gas. Um, but with lung slit spectro spectroscopy, you get more information about the wavelengths, but then you lose the spatial information. Mm -hmm. And so having one or the other, or even both combined, isn't super great um, because you're, you're not getting the full picture. So in order for my advisor to try and make a stronger case for the fluorescence thing, fluorescence idea, um, she applied for time on the Very Large Telescope in Chile to use their um, IFS instrument. Basically a... Uh, an instrument that provides both spatial and wavelength information. So for each pixel in the image, you get a wavelength, or you get a spectrum. Oh, okay. So, like this picture, um, it produces what's called a data cube. And so for each wavelength in the spectrum, the like wavelength range that you're looking at, you get an image, which is really cool. They're awesome. You get this image, and you get an image for each wavelength in the wavelength range that you're observing in. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned, but the instrument is called MUSE, it stands for Multi-Unit Spectroscopic Explorer. And so basically she got this data and directly handed it to me to do the analysis of it. And so I reduced the data and I've basically been trying to use it to um, argue in favor of fluorescence and against gravitational cooling by looking at the distribution of the gas in the nebula, like within the data cube, and then also looking at like the kinematics of the gas, in, like in with respect to those galaxies, and then comparing these things to other fluorescing nebulae that we've identified in the literature. Do you ever see like mixtures, something that would be indicative of? Oh yeah, there's definitely some fluorescence going on. But... Yeah. So there's usually like one main thing that's powering it that's easy to identify, um, but then yeah, there definitely can be like scattering and fluorescing. Mm. All of these things can contribute, but there's usually one dominating. Mm. Um, and there's actually a more recent simulation that said that, uh, like about gravitationally cooling nebulae, where they did um, cooling gravitationally cooling nebulae, and then they put an AGN inside to see like how it compares or like what the difference is. And every time they said that if there's an AGN there and gravitational cooling, the AGN is always going to be the dominant contributor, mm -hmm. which I mean kind of makes sense, right? Gravitational cooling is not a like super crazy process. I think I understand the fluorescence part, but the, the cooling part is a little confusing because to me I think of like you have a galaxy near something else and the galaxy is siphoning off material from whatever's nearby. If you're saying that it's accreting, like I think of like an accretion disk? Yeah, so not quite an accretion disk. It's um, more like a a cloud of gas that's collapsing. Uh -huh. So like early universe, everything's distributed evenly, and then matter starts to collapse in on itself to form galaxies, stars, stuff like that. So that's basically what I'm talking about is like a, an overdensity of gas that starts collapsing in on itself oh, and okay. then pulling more gas from the IGM onto it. And so you get these streams of gas flowing into and feeding the galaxy so mm -hmm. that it can produce stars and form into um, like a regular galaxy like we see. Okay. And you could probably... That sounds like it would be easy to find like that fingerprint of if you're seeing it... The streams? Yeah. Yeah. So if you see filaments, that's probably more indicative of... I would think that's more indicative of the gravitational cooling scenario. There's, it, I'm seeing a lot of parallels with what you do and kind of what I do with these different spatial and wavelength distributions because what I do, there's, if I'm looking at uh, a proton or something inside, you could talk about how the quarks are distributed inside spatially or how their momentum is distributed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's pretty cool that there's all of these parallels. With the math and stuff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and that's that's pretty much all I had prepared to show you today. So it sounds like the like overall description that encompasses your work is you have like these galaxies that are inside of a gas, and the gas emits Lyman alpha radiation that we see. Everyone's agreeing like there's Lyman alpha, and the question is what is what is powering that? 
and you have those different ideas, you and your advisor are arguing with your sample that it's powered from this fluorescence. Other people are saying that it looked like um, the gravity cooling, and so then you make these maps that are supporting the evidence of, of what you guys are uh, claiming. Exactly. Okay, yes. cool. A plus. Whew. So now all I have to do is rehearse that 10 times, that way when someone else asks me what you do, I have better answers than, ah, she does like galaxy stuff, I'm pretty sure. You can tell them I look at how um, gas around galaxies um, is moving and distributed and stuff like mm. that. Okay, that might be easier for yeah, me to remember. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> easier. Cool. That's specific to this project though. And there are two other projects I wanted to explain, but we'll save those for a different day. Cause you getting sweaty, you tired. I just exist sweaty. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So hopefully that was clear for everyone else watching also. And if you guys want me to elaborate on anything, feel free to comment in the comment about it in the comment section. Um, and thanks for watching this video. Bye.